Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I have a couple of things I want to talk about today and one of them is this calcium issue. Some new studies are calling into question the advisability of taking calcium. Again, this comes up all the time. And I guess the foundational piece of this is that in the nutrition field, anytime we find a nutrient that's beneficial, it seems that the recommendations for how much of it we should consume keep going up and up and up. Think about protein. My gosh, you know, we still 100 years after studies showed that you know, too much protein is a bad thing and people can live on much less protein than the government guidelines advise, we're still recommending too much protein. So the whole idea is if a little bit of something is good, boy, tons of it must be better for you. And calcium is a great example. And I don't want to diminish the importance of calcium. It's important to bone health. Most of the body's calcium is stored in the bones. But the recommendations for calcium intake these days just border on insane. Studies show that people in other cultures live on a whole lot less calcium than we take in here, and their fracture rate is lower than ours. Studies also show that as calcium intake goes up in a country, the fracture rate goes up too. In fact, four out of four studies that have looked at this issue in a large number of countries have arrived at the same conclusion. Now, I've been asked, how can this possibly be more calcium when calcium is so important to bones equals more fractures? Well, Amy Lanoue, who wrote a great book called Building Bone Vitality, explains it this way, and I think it's an excellent analogy. When you picture a brick wall in your mind, mostly what you see is bricks. That's the biggest surface area, and the mortar is a tiny bit of it. So you might say bricks are really important for building brick walls so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stack bricks one on top of the other and see how high I can make this wall. Well you can see what the problem is without the mortar even though it's a very tiny percentage of the surface area compared to the brick you will build a very weak structure that eventually will just fall down. So so it is with calcium we keep loading people up with calcium and forgetting the fact that there are hundreds or thousands of other nutrients involved in building bones and Amy actually refers to those as uh, mortar nutrients to take the analogy a step further. Yet we're still telling people to take calcium pills and to consume dairy products. Um, it was just not too long ago that a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed that the risk of heart disease in men went up as a result of taking calcium pills and now a new study shows the same thing for women. The researchers stated that women who take in calcium uh, more than 1400 milligrams a day had twice the risk of dying, including death from cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease, and stroke as women who consumed between 660 and 999 milligrams a day. And the increase was moderate with high calcium intake that it didn't include the supplements, but when you added the supplements to the high dietary intake, uh, the risks increased significantly. Um, this isn't the first study, by the way, published in the British Medical Journal on this calcium and uh, heart disease issue. Dr. Ian Reid, senior author of previous studies that were published in BMJ, says for every thousand people who take calcium supplements for five years, six heart attacks will be caused and three fractures will be prevented. And he concludes, quote, it's not a very effective way of preventing fractures and it probably does carry a significant risk. In spite of this, the Institute of Medicine continues to advise women over the age of 50 to consume 1,200 milligrams a day of calcium and continues to state that the tolerable upper limit is 2,000 milligrams a day. And I always love when the supplement industry weighs in, a spokesperson said, this study doesn't change these recommendations, nor should it. Well, of course, paying attention to evidence and adjusting recommendations accordingly is off the table if it hurts sales in the nutrition or medical fields. So anyway, if you're one of those folks out there still taking calcium pills, you're worried about getting enough calcium, you can put that out of your mind. Throw those pills away and stop worrying about calcium intake. You can get lots of calcium from a plant-based diet and your needs are much lower than you've been told. Now, I guess today is just all about supplements and I want to talk about another study. Um, I advise people to stay away from dietary supplements, isolated nutrient type supplements um, regularly, and also to stay away from my naturopathic colleagues who I refer to as the holistic pharmacists. And I guess I criticize my own colleagues as much as I do traditional medical doctors. Um, I guess everybody gets to hate me a little bit. But in my experience, um, I think that naturopaths share some of the same limitations as medical doctors. Few are capable of identifying the underlying causes of disease. 
They are very skilled at selling supplements, which at best are less harmful than drugs and may help with symptom control, but often are useless and sometimes harmful. To the extent that any of these natural products can be effective, they have side effects, which few people think about when they're taking something natural. And you know, people are always telling me, well, how can you be not excited about this? It's natural. And I tell them, well, poison ivy's natural, but I don't think you ought to go sit in it tonight. Well, a new study, study really points out part of what I just described to you. A Singapore-based group of researchers analyzed data from 1,601 research papers looking at uh, drugs and natural products and product extracts and synergistic natural products to try and sort all this out. And they reported that natural products are between 10 and 100 times weaker than pharmaceutical drugs, that combinations of them could be more potent and equal the potency of drugs. But the problem was that the probability that you would buy one of these combination products that actually is effective, has enough potency to be effective, is less than 3%. Now the study didn't look at the side effects of taking these products, and they're there. The studies that have um, there are many studies that have been stopped early because the side effects from the people taking the supplements um, were significant enough that they had to stop the study. But um, nonetheless, between the lack of efficacy and the potential for side effects, this is just in general a bad plan. Doesn't mean no supplements ever, but be cautious as a consumer. Beware. Now, I've given a lot of thought to this. Why is it that the efficacy rates for some of the stuff are so low, yet people are so enamored with these holistic practitioners? Don't call me that, by the way. Don't like that term at all. And remedies. And the biggest reason, I think, is the medical system itself, which is populated with sometimes arrogant people who push tests, drugs, and procedures that don't work. And so when patients see a practitioner who wants to take time with them and talk to them and recommend something that promises to make things better without the side effects associated with drugs, you know, it sounds good to them. They become enchanted with it. And this enchantment prevents people from asking the hard questions like, Where's the evidence that this is going to work? How does this work? And will this get rid of my disease? Come out of your reverie and start paying attention to the important points. As I've mentioned often, the best that can be said about some of these practitioners is they may hurt the patient less than traditional Western medical doctors will, but I don't really think that's so much of a selling point in my book. So where I, I guess I land on this issue is that um, the first step in resolving any health issue is you gotta change your overall dietary and lifestyle pattern. You can't just take a few supplements and, and that sort of thing. And, and people who try to do one-for-one -one substitutes for bad foods, they always end up in worse shape. Think fruit juice, sweetened cookies, and veggie cheeses. You don't improve your health that way. And the same is true for medical care. So substituting one set of drugs and treatments for another set of, of uh, tests and, and treatments that might be a little more natural really isn't an efficient strategy for improving your health. Find someone who's skilled at stopping and reversing disease, and the use of supplements should be be very judicious for short periods of time under the direction of a practitioner who is just using them perhaps to mitigate a symptom while your body is recovering, but not instead of addressing the underlying issues. So anyway, that's all for today. Have a great day and weekend. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back next Tuesday.